Let me elaborate on one issue raised by Jaime that we explore in our annual report and that has been a leitmotiv of BIS research over the years. Should monetary policy take financial stability into account, and if so, in what way? I will present some recent BIS research that supports the view that it should, and that suggests how it might be done. This old issue has gained greater prominence recently because of economic backdrop and also because of new research. The economic backdrop has highlighted tensions between price stability and financial stability. Many countries are struggling with strong credit and asset price booms and possibly solid growth combined with very low or even, even negative inflation. Think, for instance, of Sweden, Switzerland, China, just to name a few. This is similar to the familiar pre-crisis problems that we saw. By contrast, other countries are facing the legacy of the financial bust in the form of anemic, anemic credit and GDP growth combined with the side effects of exceptionally and persistently low interest rates, notably on the profitability and resilience of financial institutions. Meanwhile, new research has found that a leaning against the wind strategy, that is tightening monetary policy to head off financial stability risks, provides little or no benefits in terms of output <coughs> and inflation. This analysis has been taken to support the separation principle according to which monetary policy should deal exclusively with near-term output and inflation, think of this as the business cycle, whereas macroprudential policy should deal on its own with financial instability, think of this as the longer, longer duration financial cycle. I will suggest by contrast that a financial stability-oriented monetary policy can yield net benefits. But for this to be the case, it would need to keep an eye on financial stability all the time during both booms and busts, that is, during the whole financial cycle, so that the economy never strays too far away from financial equilibrium. The roadmap, I will first explain the key reasons for these different conclusions. I will then summarize the main results of ongoing BIS work, and finally, I will draw some broader implications. So let me outline the similarities and differences between the various approaches. What is the standard way of evaluating empirically the costs and benefits of a financial stability-oriented monetary policy? The basic idea is to trade off the output costs of leaning today with the possible output benefits tomorrow if leaning today helps limit the likelihood and or the costs of future banking crises. Now, how does one implement this thought experiment? Well, you take a traditional uh, model embedding relationships between the policy rate, output, and inflation. You augment it with a crisis module. This module describes the relationship between a financial variable and banking crisis. The typical financial variable here is credit growth, which some work has shown to be very closely related to be a reliable leading indicator of crisis. The module then links the financial variable to the policy rate, and then it assumes something about the output cost of crisis. Finally, you estimate the resulting net benefit in terms of output and possible inflation by adjusting policy either as a one-off deviation from a traditional policy rule or as the optimal response given the model. The conclusion of much of this analysis is that for typical parameter values, a leaning against the wind strategy does not generate significant net benefits and may be counterproductive. Now, this type of analysis is clearly sound and the findings plausible. But there are, number, there are a number of reasons why it might underestimate the potential net benefits. These reasons have to do with the assumptions and with the calibration, as shown in this table. In this work, crises do not result in permanent output losses, so that eventually output returns to its pre-crisis trend. But empirical evidence suggests that this typically does not happen. In some cases, monetary policy can even clean at no cost, but the great financial crisis suggests otherwise. Leaning may affect the crisis probability, but does not affect the crisis cost. But one might expect that the bigger the initial imbalance, the larger the cost. 
Financial variables have no or limited impact on output other than through crises. But this means that the benefits can only arise if crises occur, which can be quite restrictive. Finally, another underappreciated key assumption is that the, it concerns the evolution of financial risks. In prevailing approaches, risks do not grow over time, so that there is little or no cost to waiting. This also encourages the view that a financial stability-oriented monetary policy is best described as one that follows a traditional policy most of the time and deviates from it only once the signs of financial imbalances become evident. But the risk of this strategy is obvious. It could end up doing too little too late, or worse, it could even be seen as precipitating the very crisis it is intended to avoid. Our work explores this intuition and relaxes some of the more restrictive assumptions in the standard approach, thereby finding potential benefits. This is shown in this second column. While the specifics differ, the common aspects of this research is that it allows risk to build up over time as the economy evolves, and this is the notion of the financial cycle, which is key, and it allows monetary policy to play a bigger role in influencing both the probability and the costs of financial busts, even short of crises, so that crises are not really necessary for there to be potential benefits. So let me now turn to the two BIS studies more specifically. The first study follows most closely the standard approach. It takes as its starting point a traditional and intentionally very stylized model of the economy, but it makes one key change in the crisis model. That is, it allows the economy to exhibit realistic recurrent financial cycles, measured by a combination of the behavior of credit, property prices, and the credit to GDP gap. And this is basically based on previous work that we have done here, which has also been replicated elsewhere. Crucially, this is the variable that causes banking crisis, or more generally, financial bust with serious output costs. The difference with the prevailing approaches is illustrated in this graph, based on US data just as an illustration. You, the graph shows the difference between the financial cycle, which is the blue line, and credit growth, which is the red line. You will notice that the financial cycle exhibits clearly defined booms and busts, whereas credit growth shows no such pattern. Once the simple model is estimated and optimal policy derived, the result suggests that it is desirable to lean against financial booms. In general, the larger the size of the imbalance, the higher the net benefit from leaning because larger, larger booms cause bigger busts. And importantly, it is critical to lean early, even when the probability of a crisis is negligible. The intuition is that if the authorities wait, the problems become bigger as the boom gathers momentum. Now, importantly, this result does not hinge on the specific representation of the financial cycle. It would also hold for the more familiar credit gap leading indicator, which is basically the deviation of credit to GDP ratio from its long-term long trend, which, as you know, has been used, for instance, in Basel III to set the countercyclical capital buffer. All that is needed is that the process has sufficient inertia, as the buildup of stocks naturally has in contrast to the behavior of flows. <clears throat> the second study is based on a much more granular estimated econometric description of an economy. And here again, we take the US just as an example. The analysis proceeds in three steps. The first step is to decompose the financial cycle into two sets of variables that in the data have very stable long run relationships. These are proxies for the private sector's debt service burden, which is the ratio of interest payments and amortization to income, and a proxy for leverage, here linking the debt to income ratio to property and equity prices. Deviations of these variables from their long run relationships, these gaps, interact. And when embedded in a richer econometric system, they are found to have a first order impact on private sector expenditure and can result in financial busts with permanent output losses. In fact, they can help to trace the Great, Repression, quite, uh, Great Recession quite well out of sample. 
although the possibility of permanent losses does not depend on the great financial crisis. It's a more general property of the system. Now, think of these gaps as measuring deviations from long-run financial equilibrium. So that compared with previous studies, there is no separate crisis module. The financial cycle is fully integrated in the dynamics of the economy. The second step is to use these gaps to derive estimates of the typical and observable variables in any policy rule. These are economic slack, or the output gap, and the natural rate of interest, sometimes also known as the neutral rate. Now, to be more concrete, for those that are familiar with this, this is the time-varying intercept in a Taylor rule. Therefore, in traditional models, it is the rate that would prevail when output is at potential and inflation is on target. We estimate these unobservables by augmenting a very standard macroeconomic setup with the two financial gaps that I mentioned earlier. As a result, the natural rate now requires not only output to be at potential and inflation to be on target, but also financial equilibrium. That is, that the gaps that I was mentioning before are closed. Now, let me be clear, the financial gaps are allowed to have an impact on the output gap and on the natural rate, but it is the data that it takes whether they do. Our model encompasses the, the more traditional standard model, but the data decides which of the two is more consistent uh, with, with the statistics that we have. The third step is to carry out a counterfactual experiment, moving to a parallel universe, if so to speak. This is done by augmenting a traditional Taylor rule in terms of the output gap and inflation with the financial gaps and seeing how the economy would evolve under this different rule. In other words, now the policy rate deviates from the natural rate not only in response to uh, non-zero output gaps and inflation deviations from target, but also in response to the financial gaps. The exercise suggests a number of findings. First, a systematic response to the financial cycle proxies over and above the traditional response to output and inflation can result in significant output gains. Now, if we start the counterfactual in 2003, for instance, the gain would amount to something like 1% per year or 12% cumulatively. This exceeds the near-term cost when leaning, which amount to something like a third of a percentage point per year. Second, there need be not much cost in terms of inflation. In fact, on average, inflation is effectively unchanged. It is lower pre-crisis and higher post-crisis as economic slack is smaller at that point. Third, it is key to lean early, and this can increase considerably the room for maneuver in the past. This is illustrated in this graph, which, excuse me, which shows, or is going to show, if you can read the things at the bottom, the difference between the counterfactual and the actual policy rate, which is gonna be a blue line, and for background information, the corresponding difference for output, which is a red line. So how do things evolve in this parallel universe? Well, the policy rate is about one percentage point higher until roughly 2005. Uh, 2005. This you see that the blue line is uh, above the zero axis. It can then afford to decline earlier, start, starting roughly when asset prices peak, which is not shown in the graph and is normalized more quickly after the recession, as output recovers faster. Now, the source of the gains is that the policy helps to smooth out the financial cycle, which is shown in this other graph, with the dotted line indicating the counterfactual and the continuous line indicating the historical behavior of the variables. You can see the smaller amplitude in the cycle of asset prices, credit, and the credit to GDP ratio. Finally, the last finding, and naturally, the performance of the economy improves further if the counterfactual experiment begins earlier. This is simply because the policy has more time to work. The results also shed light on the natural interest rate. They suggest that the natural rate is higher than standard estimates would indicate. And here we're back in our, our universe, and we're just estimating these variables based on how the actual data evolve. You see here that the actual real policy rate, the yellow line, is generally below a standard natural rate estimate, blue line, which falls to zero 
towards the end of the sample. By contrast, the financial cycle adjusted natural rate, which is the red line, is generally higher. The intuition is that it is financial cycle, cycle proxies rather than inflation, which provide the information about the behavior of output and its potential. And this confirms some of our previous work, which has also been replicated elsewhere. In fact, taking the financial cycle systematically into account could actually help mitigate the decline in the natural rate in our parallel universe, as indicated in the dashed line here. The rate is on average about 40 basis points higher after 2009, pointing to greater resilience in output growth. Finally, stabilizing the economy sometimes requires sizable deviations of the policy rate from the natural rate in response to the financial gaps, so as to keep the economy not too far away from financial equilibrium. These deviations tend to be larger than in a normal Taylor rule. What conclusions could one draw from this analysis, all things considered? Well, it is important to stress that all exercises of this kind face serious analytical and econometric challenges. The findings need to be taken with more than a pinch of salt, in fact, I would say with a big spoonful of salt. Moreover, they are clearly partial in nature. They simply take existing empirical work as benchmark, and they exclude considerations such as the role of alternative instruments, first and foremost prudential policy, but also fiscal and even structural policies, and a richer characterization of the economy and of the uncertainty facing policymakers. For instance, neither BIS study ex includes explicitly the exchange rate, and hence the complications that this could uh, give rise to when you're implementing a financial stability-oriented monetary policy. And Hume will say a few words uh, later about the exchange rate. Clearly, therefore, the work represents just one contribution to the bigger debate. Personally, however, I would conjecture the two conclusions are likely to survive further scrutiny. First, there are likely to be potential gains from a more financial stability-oriented monetary policy. And second, any such policy, if it is to produce gains, would need to take financial developments into account systematically in both good and bad times, a policy of selective attention whereby monetary policy reacts only when the signs of financial imbalances become all too evident is likely to fall short of the mark. Thank you. <laughs>